Hello and welcome to Inside Out, a show where we focus on individual stocks with in-depth analysis, deep dive into the financials and tell you about the key risks and triggers going forward. Hey Nigel. Well, hey Sonal. And we, we highlight all the key matrix that Sonal just mentioned, but we also ask the questions that you want to ask. Well, let's not waste any more time and get straight to the first stock on our radar today. Sonal, what do you have for us on Deep Tech? Okay, so you know, Nigel, I've always been very curious about what Nazara Technologies really does. So I thought, let's get a deep dive and understand more about the business and get an insight from the management as well. Nazara Technology, first of the new age businesses to get listed two years back in March 2021. It saw a big surge, up 80% on the listing day. But since then, there has been a one-way downtick. The company earns revenues via subscription, that is around 29% of the revenues. Platform fees around 20 percent, ad revenues around 14 percent and brand sponsorship and media rights at 37 percent. And in terms of the segmental breakup, esports is 50 percent, gamified early learning is 24 percent, ad tech is 14 percent, real money gaming is at 5 percent, telco subscription at 5 percent and freemium is at 2 percent. So let's now get in the management of the company to understand more about the business as well. Uh, Nitish, uh, thanks a lot for joining us on the show today. Uh, the first thing that I want to ask you is what your revenue stream really is. Is it completely ad revenues? Can you split it up for us? And what is the revenue mix like? And will you change it going forward? So Nazara is, uh, you know, diversified by various uh, revenue models. It, uh, you know, we cover advertising revenues, sponsor revenues, in-app purchase revenues, subscription revenues. So the way we built the company is to ensure that we have, you know, strong diversification across a variety of uh, revenue models. And, uh, you know, we keep monetizing across all these channels, uh, depending on which monetization model is working in a particular geography. For example, subscription works really well in the US. We are able to monetize fairly well in the Indian markets today through advertising. So different uh, revenue models work in different geographies and also in different products. Uh, but we're kind of covering the entire span of revenue models. All right, Nitesh, but uh, what about the expenditure that the business has to make? Break it up for us. Is it in buying new IPs, new technology, or is it R&D? See, Nazara has been, uh, you know, pretty active in mergers and acquisitions. And we have uh, acquired some of the most popular gaming IPs. So we are very IP focused and very product focused. If you look at our portfolio of uh, games that we have, Kidopia is, uh, you know, a top game in the US uh, for kids in the age of two to eight. We recently acquired a few months back Animal Jam, which is again a very popular IP for kids in the age of eight to 14. So we invest our capital in acquiring IPs, which we believe can be monetized over a long period of time. And Nazara can really scale up these businesses by providing more expertise on user acquisition, on better data analytics, and better marketing. So this is our fundamental approach to the business, aggregating IPs or having ownership of IPs. So that is very important for us. So that's a capital expenditure for us. From an operational expenditure, I think uh, one of the largest expenses you will see is user acquisition. We spend significant amount of, amount of money, you know, acquiring users uh, to come and experience our products, acquire, you know, acquire access to our products. So I think that that's an important expenditure that we do. But we are very careful in terms of how we approach this. Uh, we are very uh, unit metric focused. So we only spend, uh, you know, money acquiring users that we can afford to. And that is extremely profitable for us. We usually have a metric of, you know, two is to one. So for every, let's say, 100 rupees that we spend, we should be able to make a net of 200 rupees back within a reasonable time frame. That's largely the, the metric that we try and, you know, uh, look at internally while spending money on customer acquisition. All right. Thanks for that. We'll come back to you in just a bit. But Sonal, you spoke about different segments. But what really is uh, it that the company does in each of the segments? Okay, it's a lot of segments, right? So let yeah. me break it down for you. In the eSports segments, which is the biggest one, company mm -hmm. earns revenues via media rights, brand sponsorships, in ads through advertisement networks, of course. In the gamified early learning, they have subscription-based fees here. In real money gaming, there is a platform fee collected from skilled games played on the platform. Freemium is where they earn it through in-app in purchases and advertisements as well. 
Telco subscriptions is where they earn revenues from partnership with telecom operators. And AdTech, which is the third largest revenue contributor, it has fee-based revenue structure for the company. So let's take this ahead. Nitish, I spoke about a lot of segments. Which is the highest margin business for you? How often can you take price hikes in subscription-based business businesses? And will it remain like that? So our gaming IP businesses are our most uh, profitable businesses today with higher margins. Uh, the esports business is a low margin business simply because it's growing at a very fast rate and in a space where we are market leaders, Nazara today has over 80% market share in the Indian market. So we are obviously reinvesting a lot of our margins into growth and strategic leadership. Coming back to the gaming IP businesses, whether it is within the gamified learning space or the premium space, uh, we have games like Kidopia, Animal Jam, World Cricket Championship, which is a fantastic franchise around cricket. Uh, these are very profitable businesses for us. Just to give you a perspective, uh, our cricket game, WCC, is generating upwards of 25% EBITDA margins already. So we see these businesses as the consumer base scales, as the revenue scale. They will turn out to be even much higher uh, margin generators for us, and we're already seeing that happen. Okay, let's focus on esports then. How do you plan to grow it? What about margins in uh, not win businesses? They're dependent on new IPs as well as on offline businesses. What is the rate at which this is done? And what does it mean for margins? Nazara is betting that uh, esports is going to become the number two sports in our, in, in our country after cricket. And uh, at the rate viewership is growing, at the rate customer interest in this uh, you know, new emerging sport is growing, we are very sure that in the next two, three, four years, we will you know, achieve that very fast. And you can imagine a number two sport in a country like India is going to be a massive uh, revenue generator and a massive uh, value creator as well. Given that today we have 80% market share, it's very important that Nazara, along with our subsidiaries like Nordwin, continue to dominate this space, create you know, entry barriers, create moats around this space. And that's exactly what we are doing. So if you see the transformation of our esports business over the last two years, you know, what was uh, events and IP, uh, you know, uh, uh, if tournament IP business, we've actually put the gamer in the center and created everything around him that he may want. So whether it is esports tournaments, they can be online, they can be offline. It is esports entertainment content. We launched something called Playground, which is a big boss for gaming season two now in association with Rusk Media, which is doing extremely well. Uh, we have offline gaming accessories. So we have Wings, which is, you know, the number one online selling accessory in its category uh, for, you know, gaming audio uh, headsets. So we have, we have kind of, uh, we have mobile gaming recharges. We have publisher relations in the esports space. So we're kind of panning the entire spectrum of what a uh, esports gamer in India would want. And we want to make sure that we are there at every touch point. I think that's what we are growing, this whole esports ecosystem. We are dominating this eco uh, uh, the esports ecosystem. And we believe this will be a very large value generator for us. As we achieve scale, this business has grown you know, upwards of 80% year on year in the last nine months, if you see. Uh, reported on our Q3 numbers. And uh, I believe that this will continue to grow very fast. Uh, at the right time, we will see, especially as media rights take off, we will see this business also become highly uh, margin operative. But that is not a priority in this business. Strategic market leadership in the esports space for Nazara is number one priority today. All right, uh, we got that. But uh, you didn't mention the margins in uh, Nordwin business. So it's it's low single digit margins uh, at this point of time, and like I said, it's a conscious approach and decision we have taken. We uh, the basic decision is let us grow our esports, uh, you know, revenues and strategic leadership, but let's not make losses, let's not burn money. So let's remain profitable. If the margins right now are diluted, that's perfectly fine. We can scale them up at a certain level. I think over the next two three years, what you will see is as esports becomes a top uh, spectator sport in our country, you will see the media rights uh, around these uh, properties and around the esports tournaments significantly increase in value. And I think a lot of that will uh, flow into the bottom line. So we are very hopeful that these single digit margins over the next three years you know, become, become larger. Very difficult to estimate what they will be today. 
but uh, that's what we are working towards okay let's talk about ad tech which is the third biggest vertical for you what is your take here global ad tech is 700 billion dollar business how much is data works here and what kind of growth rates are you looking at so data works uh, for us has grown 50 over 50% year on year so it's uh, on its own self is growing uh, at a very rapid clip and we are very happy because again it's a profitable company generating good ebitda margins and uh, generating its own cash flows and those are the type of businesses we really like to operate now on data works you know it's a uh, it's a 20 a, a little bit under 20 million dollar run rate business uh, you know like you yourself said the ad tech business is so large that uh, there's a huge room for data works to grow uh, within its own uh, own business that it operates today but there are also multiple levels of synergies with the entire nazara gaming ecosystem ad tech becomes important for gaming in multiple places including monetization of games including user acquisition including uh, you know first party data uh, of users so i think there are multiple levels that we are integrating uh, with data works so we see data works continue to grow strongly on a stand alone business as well as creating a lot of uh, value accretion for us uh, through synergies with the entire nazara network okay nitesh uh, uh, hang on to that uh, well sonal let's talk about the financials of the company now new age companies have been known to be loss making What's it for Nazara? Okay, you know it has been profit making for a long time. Growth has been decent as well in the business. In my nine months of FY23, company's revenues are more than that of FY22, and they've been focusing more on revenue growth. Margins they have been under pressure in nine months at 10%, which compares with 15% in FY22, which is led by higher OPEX and investments. Nine month uh, nine months pat is almost equal to FY22 pat, or maybe a slightly higher. Now let's talk about balance sheet because cash in the books of the company is at 660 crore rupees. and this is something which gives comfort to investors as well so uh, nitish let me ask about the growth plans for you how much will you actually be growing by from here on and what is the margin outlook for you i think uh, you know 20 25% should be the minimum growth case for us uh, year on year uh, hopefully we will achieve much better than that i think you need to look at a larger picture that uh, where is gaming in our country today and where it could be 5 7 years down the line i think uh, if you look at that picture and look at where nazara is right uh, through a diversified portfolio of products ips businesses market leadership and key uh, key markets in the gaming like e sports key emerging trends i would say like e sports uh, all of our businesses are cash flow generating we have a very strong dna to generate tangible cash flows be profitable i think if you overlap this with the overall uh tailwinds in the gaming industry i think we are only getting started also nazara has you know a history of over two decades which means that we have the ability to persevere to pivot in a fast changing environment and gaming is you know based on technology which changes very fast i think we have the fantastic dna and experience to take advantage of these opportunities so i'm very hopeful that we will, we will uh, you know bring it all together to ensure that we can continue to deliver fast growth which is driven alongside profitability now uh, let's focus on your revenue mix then you get close to 40% of revenues from india 60% is exports will this continue or will there be a bit of a change out there in terms of revenue mix you know we see both segments uh, continue to grow for us aggressively at some point of time i think the indian revenues will significantly accelerate as a propensity to pay in india increases much more the consumption is already very high so i think there will be a catch up that india may grow if you were to zoom out 5 years perhaps india revenues could be majority for us but at this point of time we are aggressively growing both indian revenues and uh, global revenues it also helps us again from a diversification basis some of the products it helps us to you know launch products in the us market where we can get the monetization right we can compete with the best in global markets you know and get a product right over there and then bring it to india we are doing it with products like edopia and i think uh, that will be also very successful in india so i think over a period of time india revenues may surge ahead of global revenues but at this point of time in the next year or two i think uh, you will still see both revenues grow strongly 
well you're known to be a company that makes a lot of acquisitions so what is the process in terms of strategic acquisitions how does the management decide which company to invest in and the typical process around it we have a framework internally but we continue to be an uh, investor who wants to buy, buy, if I were to quote uh, the classic uh, Buffett theory, right? Buy, the, buy a good company at the right price. Uh, we are a value investor. Uh, if you've seen most of our deals in the past, you know, we have not got carried away with FOMO because especially in tech world, many times a lot of exciting things happen and you can get carried away by the FOMO. We are very careful about that. We like to buy the right business at the right value. We bought Animal Jam, uh, the Wildworks company, a few months back, had a 1x of revenue. Uh, you know, we thought it was a fantastic deal for us and a great IP with a very passionate community, which we can really scale. So that's how we think about it. We prefer to buy businesses that are not burning a lot of cash because in you know, our DNA is to you know, run profitable, tangible, cash flow generating businesses. So we don't go very much out of a comfort zone to buy businesses that are burning a lot of cash. But if it's a small burn uh, in the, uh, towards the right objective, then we don't mind it. And we uh, once we buy these businesses, we focus very hard on how to make them profitable and cash flow generating very quickly. So that's how we think about it. Mm. Uh, in the current environment is a fantastic environment with markets down, kind of a funding winter around with startups, uh, you know, struggling to raise capital. I think Nazara could be a great partner to many startups in the gaming and adjacent spaces. And also we could get very good opportunities ourselves. So we are very actively working on, you know, new opportunities uh, in this space. Well, Nitesh, you know, Sonal just mentioned that one factor that gives some comfort is the cash in books. So what are the plans with regard to this cash in the books? How much of it is with SVB or any US European banks? Also, will you look at paying out dividends? The SVB issue is sorted for us. We had uh, 64 crore rupees stuck in SVB, but uh, we were able to salvage all of that. So I think uh, that's in the past for us. In terms of dividends, sure, at some point of time, we would love to, but we think uh, capital redeployed for growth and uh, you know investments today is the best use of uh, the shareholder capital. So I think we, in the near future, we will continue to do that. And in terms of a cash, you know, we have over 600 crores of uh, cash with us and we will uh, continue to attractive uh, deploy it into attractive investments the company itself generates uh, positive cash flows so we do not need you know cash flows to fund our day-to-day -day operations so most of the capital will either get deployed into organic growth or into uh, you know acquisitions okay Okay, you know, I was looking at the company structure. You do have a lot of subsidiaries. So will you look at restructuring of any sorts, make the structure simpler? Will you raise capital in any of your subsidiaries? We may definitely raise capital in some of our subsidiaries. Uh, the advantage of today's structure is we have a lot of optionality and uh, gives us a lot of flexibility uh, within each of our businesses to structure how we can. Of course, uh, if you delve very deep into our structure, it does look complicated. But if you zoom out and just look at what is Nazara's philosophy, DNA and approach to the gaming ecosystem, things will look a lot more simpler. OK, final question then, Sonal. Uh, you know, tell us about the shareholding pattern. Some big names are there, I believe. And also, as always, what about valuations? OK, so the promoter holding in this company, it is now low at 19%. But this is supported by big institutional holdings, Nigel. Mutual funds hold 5%. Insurance companies, they hold around 1.05% stake. Rekha Rakesh Junjunwala at 10%. Foreign companies have 4.19% stake in the company. Bodies corporate at 11.3%. So some big names supporting uh, the stock, uh, stock movement as well. Valuations, they are not very cheap. Even after the big fall that we've seen, it trades at 44.7 times one year forward earnings. Okay, all right. So now thanks so much for telling us uh, about that. And thank Thank you, Nitish, as well, for joining in and giving us details of the company. But it's time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock. CSV Bank is the stock on our Swatlight segment. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Inside Art on CNBC TV 18. This is our Swatlight segment. So, Nigel, let's get straight to it. What is the stock on your radar today? Well, the company that we're tracking today is CSP Bank. You know, and the bank, it's a 
a mix of a couple of focus areas of the street. One is the street has a consensus buy on good quality banking stocks. Most of the thesis is buy on dips out and good quality banking stocks. And also CSB Bank, well, they have exposure to gold, which is seeing renewed interest. This says global equities have gone into a bit of a tizzy. What else stands out for the bank is that they have relatively better NIMS in comparison to its peer set. And as is the case with banking names, it's, it's corrected more than 10% from its recent peak. Okay, so tell us more about this gold exposure that the company has and also on its net interest margin, which is relatively better. Well, gold consists of nearly around 45% of its advances. And in the past quarter, it grew by close to around 51% on a year-in-year -year basis. That clearly indicates that they're gradually eating into the market share of gold financers like Mudut as well as Manapuram. Now, since it is more of a retail-focused bank, it reflects in its NIMS as it's much higher in comparison to its peer group, which also has some exposure to gold. Now, gold loans, remember, they attract better yields in comparison to other loans, and credit cost is almost zilched. Okay, interesting there. So, Nigel, where do they have maximum gold exposure? And also, what is their target in terms of loan book mix in the coming years? Well, bulk of their gold loans have exposure to South Indian states. That's namely Kerala, Tamil Nadu, as well as Andhra Pradesh. Additionally, the management has said that they intend to grow the SME and the corporate loan book from year on, and they've given their vision for 2030. Gold as a percentage of their advances will come down to around 20%, from around 45% currently. Okay, so now tell us more in terms of the net interest margin trends, with some focus on cost of deposits and also yields on advances. Well, the cost of deposits have moved up, and it's likely to move up in the coming quarter. That's for the entire banking system on the whole. Well, the NIMS as well have spiked up. The management has said that they would be content with NIMS around 5%. They're also targeting overall loan growth of around 25% odd. The bank has been bracing for growth as they've increased the total number of branches by nearly around 15% in the past one year. And that's much faster in comparison to the industry on the whole. Okay, so Nigel, more questions now. Give us some insights into the asset quality and also tell us about return ratios. Well, the asset quality sonal has been improving. You know, you look at the gross NPAs, you look at the net NPAs as well as the slippage ratio. They have been dipping over the past few quarters and their ROA is roughly around 2.4% odd. Okay, all right. Nigel, now let's always, as we do it, wind it down with valuation snapshot and a brief insight into the shareholding as well. Okay, let's do that then. On a price to book value basis, well, it trades at around 1.2 times odd. That's a little higher than its peer set, but it's not very, very expensive. The promoter of the group is the Fairfax Group, which is owned by Prem Vatsa, while its shareholding, well, it boasts of some of the biggest marquee institutional names, both domestic as well as foreign. All right, Nigel, that was some good information on CSB Bank. Thank you so much for telling us all about it. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Inside Out. It's a goodbye from Nigel and I. But you do write to us and tell us about companies that you want us to discuss and you want to hear about. We'll be happy to feature them on the show. Thanks so much for watching.